Well, we're delighted um, to uh, welcome a whole series of um, punchy, brief keynotes this afternoon. Uh, I hope some of you will have counted how many we have. There's quite a number. It's in double figures. Uh, this is a wonderful way to stoke up our thinking uh, as thought leaders at the beginning of the week. Uh, this will require our speakers to stick within their time limits. And um, one reason why I think I have been asked to host this afternoon is because I have a, a certain reputation for brutal timekeeping at conferences. Uh, delighted to welcome up our first keynote presenter, who is Emilio Mordini, whom many of you will know. I believe he spoke here last year. Um, he is the director of the Center for Science, Society, and Citizenship in Rome. Uh, he is by training originally uh, an MD and a, um, a psychologist, psychoanalyst. He has worked in bioethics and now into technology policy. And he's also a good personal friend, Emilio. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, I, I, I'm worried this is uh, the worst way to start uh, uh, the series of keynotes with uh, a, a psychiatrist uh, of the worst kind. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist uh, uh, psychoanalytically trained. So I'm going to be more confused and more... Uh, foggy than clouds. So it is the worst way uh, to metabolize your lunch. Uh, my, mm, let, me, let me just uh, tell you how I am arrived to technology ethics. My first interest was, uh, and I spent my my first part, my half part of my professional career uh, with a private practice, a clinical practice. So I, I worked with uh, people. And I understood that uh, you can understand uh, individuals if you understand uh, groups, if you understand society. Because uh, uh, human beings are strange animals. Uh, we are... Uh, we like autonomy, we like liberty, we are individuals, but uh, uh, we live in a web of human relations, and without human relations, we, uh, we do not exist simply. And this tension is probably one of the reasons of a lot of uh, diseases uh, and uh, uh, even mental disturbances. But from, uh, uh, from society, you uh, start uh, dealing with uh, technology, with products of society. What is technology? Huh? What is this? Why we should respect this uh, object? Because it is not an object. This is a crystallized human being, within this small, small object, within this mobile, there are thousands, millions of human beings. Intelligence, life, experience. Technology is materialized life. Technology must be respected for this. So, my presentation, uh, I, I have no time, 20 minutes, and I know very well our chairman is very strict. So I, I have no time to develop uh, strong, sound arguments. I'm just in sharing thoughts better. I'm trying to share thinking with you. So technology... In order to understand technology, we have to understand the all meanings that are carried out by technology. 
Technology is not only a means to an end, something for doing something, something else. But technology is also language, is also a way in which we express our wishes, our fear, our fantasies. And even the way in which we select words uh, uh, is meaningful. I understand very well that uh, uh, calling a technology clouds is also a way to market it. But remember, there is always a sense behind words and behind the way in which, war, in which we call objects. What is the relationship between clouds and identities? Okay, I, I've worked a lot on identity technology in the last uh, decade, chiefly on biometrics. Uh, you know, the, the, the traditional uh, interest uh, towards uh, identity technology is related to the interest for the state, nation state, why states are interested in, in, in identification, for horrible reasons, eh? for taxation, conscription and the administration of justice. This is the reason why people are so worried by identity card, identification technologies, because it is, this is an historical memory that each time that they, a state wants to identify citizens, they want to do it for tax them chiefly, or to send them to, to fight a war, or, or other horrible things, or to jail them. Hmm? But actually, there are other reasons which make identification extremely relevant to individuals claims of right, establishing any kind of contracts of trade, and uh, uh, ensuring ownership. So this is uh, the reason why, in this moment, identification technology is extremely important and extremely relevant to people because they can ensure these basic rights to the majority of people in the world which cannot afford rights, ownership, contracts, because they do not have secure identities. Two-thirds of uh, uh, the inhabitants of the world in this moment do not have certain identity documents in their hands. But to understand the role of identity today, you have to understand what happened with the information revolution. And to understand the information revolution, you should go back as a, an example to the industrial revolution. What is the difference between these two groups of people? Huh? These are where poor people, these were workers. What made, what turned poor people into workers? The discovery or the creation of a new good, of a new commodity, labor. The industrial revolution invented a new merchandise, labor, the labor market. The idea of a labor market was unthinkable before industry. So, in the 17th century, I was poor. In the 19th century, I was rich of my work. I can sell my work. Formation revolution. What is the difference between these two teenagers? In the 50s, that was an adolescent. Today, this lady can sell information. She is rich. She is no longer a poor adolescent, but she is rich because she has a merchandise, a good, a commodity that didn't exist in the 50s. 
And exactly as the Industrial Revolution was possible thanks to technology, the Information Revolution is possible thanks to technology, because technology is the instrument, the means which turn simple information into digital information. And digital information is the key, because digital information is a commodity, can be marketed. But, and this has, this has created a gold rush, eh? we have discovered hundreds of gold mines. This is the gold mines of the information society. We are producing information because information is a commodity. This poses a problem, the poses the problem of money. In this environment, could we use the same money we used in the past? These are the four functions of money traditionally. Initially, money were commod was commodity money. I take a commodity, it's just a, a, a slightly transformation of the barter system, of the barter economy. I take one kind of commodity and turn it into money. The next step was representative money. I take any a piece of paper or whatever, and is representing the commodity. At a certain moment, the gold standard, which was a commodity money, was not tenable any longer. It was in the, six, in the 70s of last year. It was the first an attempt to use the dollar as a standard. Other experience, but this is not exactly a feasible situation, as we all know in this moment. But what is the lesson to be learned? First, there is no need of an official currency. As a matter of fact, the market decides what is the needed money. And money is a living creature. They change over time. And uh, basically, it is the market which decides the destiny of a currency. And the information revolution is, using, is based more and more on electronic money. Electronic money is crystallized information. Today, we already speak of digital cash. But digital cash... Uh, is uh, still something old, is stored money. Basically, you still need. When you use uh, uh, this card, which is a debit card, you need money on your bank account. Maybe you, you can have gold on your bank account, but you need a commodity. But uh, already, when I pay with a credit card, hmm, do you really need money on your bank account? No. You need trust, which is a strange commodity. But with this one, this is a priority pass. I pay lounges in the airport, but it is not a credit card. What is that? The new currency is fluid, much more fluid than normal money. It's not issued by state. In most airports, I can use the American Express to check in in the airport. If uh, I use electronic check-in, they ask me my passport or, in alternative, a credit card. So this is also an instrument to certify my identity. But it is not issued by a state. It is issued by the American Express. 
American Express is guarantee my identity. So, what is the gold standard of e-currency? Identities. The new gold are identities. And this is the triangle. The same technology is creating this triangle, cloud computing, identity management, e-money. They are the same, the different sides of the same object. The same technology and the same concept behind. There are some, even today, there are some uh, applications already. Like this is an application, the wallet in the clouds. It's a Google application, but this is very rudimental, very preliminary applications. I can predict that in the future, you, we are going to use much more sophisticated application. In social science, uh, you use uh, this technique to validate uh, hypotheses. This technique is called negative case analysis. You take a case which apparently demonstrates uh, that your hypothesis is wrong. And then you analyze that case to test your hypothesis. So I took as a validating test the Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an anonymous currency, maybe you know it, which is used uh, online, especially in the so-called deep web or dark web, uh, to pay transactions in which you want to remain anonymous. And uh, as a... Uh, uh, as had, uh, it was in the limelight uh, uh, in the last year. This is Bitcoin. Basically, you have to deposit, you have to, to deposit money anonymously, and you receive uh, uh, anonymously this currency, this uh, electronic currency. But from an economic point of view, a financial point of view, Bitcoin uh, is uh, having. Uh, a, a sad evolution. I'm not an economist, I'm not able to analyze uh, this kind of uh, uh, graphs, but uh, uh, economists uh, tell, told me that uh, Bitcoin is not a big business in this moment. But I'm more interested in this. As a matter of fact, uh, Bitcoin is not anonymous you can trace back all transactions also with Bitcoin. And this is obvious, because you have to remember this basic law of the electronic world. Nothing is anonymous online. Never, never. Forget it. Forget the fantasy, the dream of the nightmare of an, anom an anonymous a transaction online. It is not possible. Everything can be unraveled online. But we have this scenario, the internet economy. These figures are uh, astonishing, they are massive. By 2015, half world population will be connected. The internet economy today is uh, the fourth world economy, more than Germany. In this scenario, you need to ground electronic money on a certain ground. And I repeat, the only way to do it is to ground electronic money on identity. And this is the reason, to me, why the fight around identity management, the discussion, the controversial, the quarrels about state, privacy, advocacy, and so on, it's so important. 
because it doesn't concern only issues like data protection, but it concerns the world economy of the next future. Of course, at this point, one can pose the question whether this is desirable. But I think this is a, a pointless question. As a matter of fact, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, to ask whether a trend is desirable. You have to learn how to govern trends rather than discuss if it is good or bad. And this is a very strong trend because it's driven by one of the most strong drivers for human beings, which is the wish to, 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 to materialize without time and space limitations desires, wish, wishes. The Internet is our collective dream. Of course, we have to pay attention because uh, as a psychiatrist, I know very well that it is uh, the, 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 the border between dreams uh, and nightmares is very subtle. Uh, a saint, Saint Therese, a, a, a Renaissance, a Spanish uh, saint, a Spanish lady, a mystic, once wrote uh, that uh, we should uh, uh, hope that God does not uh, uh, satisfy all our prayers. If you want uh, to curse someone, if you want uh, to wish a bad destiny to someone, wish him that God will satisfy all his prayers. We desire things that uh, in our interest it would be better, will never become reality. So when uh, we have a dream like the Internet, we should pay a lot of attention. Said so, I want uh, to conclude my uh, lecture, my conversation with you, with uh, uh, the origin of my speech. I told you that the Internet is a dream, but when I say that it is a dream, I don't mean that it is something irreal, because dreams are real more than reality. And uh, uh, I started by saying that uh, clouds is a word uh, which uh, describes an atmosphere, a, a phenomenon in the sky, but also a technology. And uh, clouds and cloud computing are two dreams. They the are uh, fantasies. And technology can be beauty and uh, uh, deep rooted in human mind as clouds. And they both speak of human beings. This is the end of uh, the Pasolini's movie about clouds. Emilio, wherever time we could have to stop. Così non fosse, non capirei più niente. Tutto il mio folle amore, lo so che il cielo, lo so che il cielo, così. Ah, ma l'erba 
suavemente delicata di un profumo che dai pagini. Ecco, se ne porta via. Ah, non ne vedremo più. Tu non sei mai nata. Addio, Tello. Addio per sempre. Tutto il mio folle amore. Lo soffia il cielo, lo soffia il cielo, così. Il derubato che sorride, ruba qualcosa al ladro, ma il derubato che piange, ruba qualcosa a se stesso. Perciò io mi dico finché sorriderò tu non sarai per tu. Ma queste son parole e no, non va sentito. Un cuore affranto si cura con l'udito e tutto il mio folle amore lo soffia il cielo, lo soffia il cielo. Quanto so belle, quanto so belle, quanto so belle. <ride> ah, straziante, meravigliosa bellezza del creato. Ah. I started by saying that we should respect this object. I would like to conclude that we should respect technology as we respect clouds. Thank you. Thank you very much.